witnesses are on the phone. Um, we may actually get a little time in between, but um, our first witness is Chad Marlow, and he's Advocacy and Policy Council for the ACLU. And these are in no particular order. It's when we could get people. Um, and the ACLU came to us and asked to talk. So uh, we can just switch over now. <coughs> okay. Hello, Mr. Marlowe. Can you hear me? I'm sure. Okay. I'm Ann Cummings, and you're with the Senate Finance Committee, and there is a room full of people here. Um, and we are just starting our discussion about net neutrality and the recent federal changes and what they might mean to the states and what powers the state might have. So I don't know, you know, in what area you wish to uh, address us, but the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, thank you, Chairperson Cummings, the members of the Senate Foundation Committee. Again, my name is Pat Lombo, and I am an advocate and policy counsel of the American Civil Liberties Union. Uh, and I wanted to thank you sincerely for the opportunity to testify before your committee today. Uh, information and communication are the lifeblood of democracy. When they are permitted to flow freely, our democracy grows and strengthens. When they are blocked or inhibited, our democracy slowly dies. The FCC's December 2017 decision to grant internet service providers, or ISPs, the ability to decide what content is permitted to operate on the information superhighways HOV lanes, what information is relegated to the slow lane, and what information is prohibited from even accessing the on-ramp presents a significant threat to the freedom of all Americans and certainly to the people of Vermont. Arguments by the FCC that the end of net neutrality will foster greater internet freedoms and innovation are not only patently false, they are absurd. The threats posed by the end of net neutrality are not hypothetical. In the absence of net neutrality in the United States and elsewhere, we have seen content slowed and blocked based upon the political views and business interests of ISP companies. For example, AT&T censored a live Pearl Jam concert stream in response to criticisms of President George W. Bush by the band's lead singer Eddie Vedder. Verizon blocked text messages from the pro-choice advocacy group NARAL because Verizon deemed them to be controversial. TELUS, a Canadian telecom company, blocked the website of a union with which it was engaged in a labor dispute. AT&T limited its customers' use of FaceTime to coerce them into buying more expensive data plans. And AT&T, Sprint, T-Mobile, and Verizon all blocked mobile wallet applications like Google Wallet that competed with their own mobile wallet application. The internet provides methods of discovering and communicating information that were inconceivable a few generations ago, but today are central and indispensable to how Vermonters learn about their world and communicate their ideas with family, friends, <clears throat> and even strangers. The idea that ISP companies are now empowered to decide what information and ideas on the internet receive preferential or disfavored treatment has outraged Americans from coast to coast. Should the Vermont legislature take action to protect that neutrality, it would join at least 25 other states that have already either introduced or are on the verge of introducing net neutrality bills. In addition, the governors of Montana and New York have already issued executive orders to preserve net neutrality. While the approaches taken may vary, the common theme of these bills and orders is a loud pronouncement from states that the FCC's elimination of net neutrality is unacceptable. As many of you know, the Vermont House of Representatives has already introduced net neutrality legislation. The approach that bill, H680, takes to protecting net neutrality is particularly laudable. When an action of the federal government places the freedoms of Vermonters at risk, the state should respond in any and every way that it can, and H680 certainly does that. It makes net neutrality a condition of complying with Vermont consumer protection laws. It makes net neutrality a condition of broadband pole attachment and line extensions. It makes net neutrality a condition of using wireless communication facilities on state-owned buildings, structures, land, highways, and rights of way. It makes net neutrality a condition of receiving a certificate of public good from the Public Utility Commission. 
and it makes net neutrality a condition of ISPs procuring state contracts for broadband internet access. For that reason, the ACLU strongly supports the adoption of H680. Although the FCC is asserting that states are now preempted from acting to preserve net neutrality, the truth is there is no consensus amongst attorneys on that point. The fact that nearly half the states are pursuing efforts to save net neutrality certainly speaks to that. Preemption is simply a matter the courts will have to decide on an approach-by-approach -approach basis. <clears throat> Such uncertainty should not preclude this state from adopting net neutrality legislation. To the contrary, the only way to find out if the state of Vermont has the ability to protect net neutrality for its citizens, residents, and visitors is to adopt a net neutrality law. Of equal importance, by adopting a net neutrality law, regardless of the ultimate judicial outcome, Vermont will join a national course of states that are loudly and clearly announcing that they find the rollback of net neutrality to be unacceptable, that net neutrality should be restored by the FCC, and that if it is not, states like Vermont will not sit idly by to the detriment of their people. By adopting a net neutrality law, this state will take up the fight to protect internet freedom within its borders, and in so doing, will pose a very direct question to the FCC, Congress, and internet service providers like AT&T, Comcast, and yes, Verizon, when it comes to Vermont's unequivocal support for net neutrality. Can you hear me now? Thank you for this opportunity to testify. I'd be happy to answer any questions the committee may have. Okay, thank you. Committee, questions? Okay. We have none. Thank you very much. That was my pleasure. Thank, Thank you for having me. Thank you. Okay. Um, <laughs> what I'm looking for, we have until two o'clock when we're going to get Mr. Feld on the line. He's next. It get you. It, see if you can get him a little early, and if not, I was going to see if somebody <coughs> could come up. Mr. Starro, would you like your? I've got Maria, and I know she's got about an inch thick pieces of technicality she's going to walk us through. So, do you want to come on up and? Yeah, sure. All right, Brian, did you hang up? Yes. Okay. Good afternoon, uh, com committee. Uh, my name is Charles Storo. I'm with Leonine Public Affairs, and I'm testifying uh, this afternoon on behalf of AT&T. Thank you for the opportunity to provide this testimony. Um, AT&T supports a free and open internet, but objected to the legal basis used by the FCC in 2015 to impose net neutrality rules on internet service providers like AT&T. At the outset, I want to make a distinction between managing traffic on the network of, on a non-discriminatory basis or for other legitimate purposes, such as giving priority to first responders as part of the first net system and a non-net neutral internet, i.e. paid prioritization. And let me explain that a little bit. Any internet network is going to have a finite capacity in terms of the amount of data it can handle. Um, the company does take steps sometimes to m manage that because it only has so much capacity and the previous witnesses uh, reference to throttling or activity regarding <coughs> FaceTime was exactly such a thing. If those of you don't know, FaceTime is a video you know, conferencing kind of service. It's very data intensive. 
if that's done on a non-discriminatory basis, in other words, you're not favoring one particular content provider over another, but you're applying it equally, then that is network management. Net neutrality or net non-neutrality, on the other hand, is the idea that, and it's really, I guess, encapsulated in the concept of so-called paid prioritization, that a company like AT&T would have a business arrangement with a particular, say, e-commerce retailer that their website would load faster than others. That's non-net neutrality. That would be not being neutral. So there's an important distinction to keep in mind in that regard. Um, it, the first net is this public safety uh, broadband communications network. Net Under the terms of that, the company, if there's an emergency, uh, they will give priority to the traffic generated by first responders, which they will know because of the technology in the phones. It, it, so that they can get through and uh, it may result in ordinary users not being able to get through but I would submit that that's a legitimate that's purpose an yeah, yeah. Issue. yeah since the inception of the internet in the early 1990s AT&T has operated its network in a neutral fashion and is committed to continuing to do so not only is the company committed to net neutrality as a matter of principle, but the marketplace demands it. If AT&T did paid prioritization, there would be a lot of screaming, and there would be a competitor who would say, we don't do that, and we would lose customers. So the marketplace will impose discipline, but AT&T beyond that believes in the concept in principle. The December 2017 FCC action repealing the 2015 rules restored the situation to that which existed from the early 1990s to 2015, which is to treat internet service providers as, provide, as providing information service, and this is a classification <laughs> under the telecom laws, as opposed to being treated as a common carrier and that, and that treatment was the result of the 2015 uh, FCC ruling. Basically, been long time, long time classification of internet service providers as an information service. The FCC in 2015, on its own volition, reclassified internet service providers as a common carrier. Uh, that's the, the rub for us right there. Um, is, is treating us as a common carrier. Um, again, from the early 1990s up until that reclassification as a common carrier, internet service providers were treated as providers of information service, and they in fact operated their networks in a neutral fashion. Can you tell us what the difference is in the can or why that change got made? Well, basically, uh, the change got made because in the absence of classifying as, us as a common carrier, the FCC didn't have the legal authority to impose the net neutrality rules. Okay. So, in other words, if we're information, there's a separate sort of regulatory scheme or regulatory touch that's applied to information service providers, and it's a lighter touch versus a common carrier, which is a heavier touch. It would treat us like a regulated public utility. So, but for them to make that change, I assume that somebody felt they needed to use the heavier touch. Was something was in the wind? I don't know if you know, but. I do know. I, I, it, well, it, it, it was this concept that none of the internet service providers dreamed up. It's my understanding it was a professor who said, geez, these internet service providers could become non-neutral and they could do paid prioritization, so we ought to pass a law against that. And so everybody said, yeah, let's do that. And so the FCC in 2015 responded that there wasn't any instance other than distinguishing from net, network management 
that that would happen. There's been no instances of paid prioritization. Right. So that's the thing. There's no experience. It was a theoretical concern. You know, it's in theory could happen. The com company doesn't plan on doing that. And as I said, the market would punish it if it did. Um, and that's, you know, evidenced by the fact that for 15 odd years, there wasn't any non, you know, content providers were treated equally uh, in a non-discriminatory fashion. And so it's frustrating for the company because they're basically being caught up in a controversy that they didn't do anything to cause. But they didn't like the legal basis for doing that. Now, the, the issue needs to be solved by Congress. It is a major policy issue that should be de not be determined by a federal agency depending on who the president is. Uh, and because it is a national issue, it should not be addressed by the states on a piecemeal basis. State-specific rules are administratively unworkable, unmanageable, and technically infeasible. AT&T supports federal legislation to permanently protect an open internet and has urged Congress to act. And in fact, yesterday, the company had published in major newspapers a full page open letter from the chairman and CEO of the company asking Congress to act. And um, you know, that's where it should be resolved. And so we would respectfully urge that the committee not take any action on the issue. And uh, there's no non-neutrality occurring. There's no intent to be non-neutral and let the Congress address it. Uh, I'm wondering, Mr. Starr, would you mind responding to the ACLU's testimony about what happened with AT&T as it relates to, you know, the, what the George W. Bush reference, the, the, the FaceTime, as well as the wallet applications? I have and a, you don't have, I have it right here if you need it. Uh, no, no okay. I, heard, I heard the previous witness speak to that. Um, and I have a one pager on the FaceTime situation that I could open up and, and you know, it's more than you'd want to sit here listening to me read. I, I guess I'm wondering, are these, is this accurate? The, the FaceTime uh, issue was a matter of network management. It wasn't non-net neutrality. And I can, I, it's a technical thing. Okay. It basically comes back to the fact that AT&T was the first national carrier and had for a while exclusive rights to sell the iPhone. When the iPhone came out and people started buying them, the company got clobbered. The amount of data going over its network went up something like 5,000%. The network was not adequate for that. They got caught with their, you know, with their, you know, pants down on that one because they sold a product that resulted in usage on their network that they weren't ready to handle. So the FaceTime is an aspect of that. They've been pouring, you know, they pour 20 to 30 billion dollars a year into their network. They're the, I think for at least quite a few periods of time, the single largest investor in the American economy, the capital and expenditures AT&T has done. A lot of that investment is geared towards expanding the coverage footprint, mm -hmm. but a lot of it goes to just reinforcing the existing network because the more traffic going over the network, you have to densify the network to have, even if you're in an area of coverage, you've got to have more capacity. The equipment's gone from 2G, 3G, 4G, now we're up to 4G LTE. So they've, they're, they, they've, they've turned the corner on all of that. The Facebook's, the FaceTime issue was an aspect of that. And I, that's as much as I can give you right now with short of reading. The and the censoring of Pearl Jam? I, that's news to me. News and to I you. was just texting my, my contact, did we censor Pearl out. Jam? Okay. And it's news to me. Okay. Thank you. Uh, but you know, we don't have a paid prioritization thing where uh, particular websites, um, you know, get favored. Uh, we don't. We own Directv, which provides a lot. Mm -hmm. We the company owns Directv, which provides a lot of content. We don't favor that content uh, over other content. 
Um, they're trying to buy Time Warner, uh, the cable channels, CNN, all of that. They won't favor uh, that content over CBS. Um, and as you'll read from Mr. Stevenson's letter, they're committed to that. They just need a federal solution and it should be resolved at the federal level, not at the FCC level, and respectfully, not at the state level. Thank you. I think one of the things is there are no dates on the ACID allegations, which makes it impossible to know if they happened under the old, you know, if it was pre-2015 or post-2015, so. I think I heard the gentleman say. Well, George pre Bush was president. We can sort of. The Pearl Jam, yeah. yeah. The FaceTime, I think I heard him say 2007, but I, like I said, I, I, yeah, I, it's not I could be wrong. Yeah. So it sounds, all right, so, yeah. all right. Um, I said Senator Sorokin, then Senator Lyons, and Senator Polina. Okay. We may have to cut this short. Okay, I'll try to be brief. So you say you objected to the legal basis. Do you object to the policy basis? No, that's the thing. We, we agree to the idea of a legal requirement to be net neutral, but we don't want to be treated as a common carrier in order for that to be accomplished. So if Congress should pass a net neutrality bill that doesn't make us a common carrier but requires us to be net neutral, and we would urge the committee to urge the assembly to pass a resolution urging Congress to do that. So in the interim, if we did something in this regard, the impact of it from a policy perspective wouldn't be objectionable to you? I guess I have to concede that, yeah, yes, that's right. Now, there's some, in the House bill, They've got all these requirements that if you want to put up a cell tower, if you want to attach cable to poles and all of these things, you've got to be net, neut net neutral. And, you know, that's uh, kind of cutting your nose off to spite yourself because don't we want cell towers and uh, extension of cable and all that? But I, I understand, you know, if you play by the rules and be net neutral, then there wouldn't be any issue there. But we don't want a lot of different state rules around this, Senator. And there are significant preemption issues that, you know, I'm not pushing or, or arguing here, but uh, you would want to hear from counsel about the preemptive It doesn't sound like if we did anything. <laughs> from AT&T's perspective that the policy we're trying to implement would be objectionable. But there may not be, there may be companies out there that would take advantage of this interim period where there is no net neutrality that may have a different opinion than you. So we have to protect against all companies, not just the honorable AT&T. You'll hear from all the other, uh, I think you'll hear from all the other relevant uh, telecom providers and they will all basically say the same thing. Um, and I'm not aware of any, you know, startup out there that's going to, you know, say, hey, let's go out and be net, non-net neutral. But again, you know, we don't want it to do it on a state-by-state -state basis. It needs a federal solution. And um, that's where we come from on that point. Senator Lyons. No, I think I'm good. I think I'm good. Um, but this you support, AT&T supports, um, the Consumer Bill of Rights yep. and what would happen if that were put into statute? You know, we'd have to see exactly, and I don't know exactly what the details of it are, <laughs> are uh, you know, the, if, if Vermont adopted exactly what at and is proposing Congress to do, you know, at one level that wouldn't be, a, it wouldn't be bad, but again, we don't want state by state uh, activity on this regard and there's no urgency to the situation because if AT&T tomorrow became non-net neutral in the face of what I've passed out, an open letter from the company's president saying we're not going to do that, there would be, you know, justifiable outrage. So there isn't a crisis at least as far as AT&T's behavior um, is concerned. You mentioned that um, 
the, 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 the market demands that you don't do paid prioritization right now because others would jump in and it would be a problem for AT&T. But I guess the concern is that if one company does paid prioritization and another company will, another company will be in this kind of a wild west atmosphere where everybody's you know going down the road of taking away that neutrality and people are trying to become more competitive in the marketplace. Well, if I was, for the sake of discussion, the, the leadership of T-Mobile, I would carve out a little niche. T-Mobile has brought intensive price competition to the wireless market. I don't know if you've noticed that, but prices have gone down because T-Mobile has been very aggressive in pricing and they gaining customers from us. I have no idea that, you know, I don't speak for T-Mobile, but there's enough players out there that, you know, if they all did it, somebody would say, we can get an advantage if we don't. And the, and the market would punish those who were non-neutral in favor of those who are. And, you know, in theory, could they all be that way and present a wall? I suppose, but I, it, it, it wouldn't, somebody would say, it's like the gas stations. I'm gonna drop my price two cents from the guy down the road, then that guy has to keep up with that. There would be a lot of active, the competitive market in wireless is very competitive. Um, and so a company would do that at their peril. Thank you. And so um, then the floor is yours. Thank you very much. My name is Harold Feld. I am Senior Vice President of Public Knowledge. Public Knowledge is a nonprofit digital rights advocacy organization based in Washington, D.C. Um, I thank you very much for the opportunity to testify today. Uh, I wish to begin by observing that contrary to what uh, um, you may have heard recently, um, until December 15th, 2017, we have always had a principle of non-discrimination. It's true. We did not call it net neutrality until 2002 because we didn't have to. In the beginning, all of these were classes of communication. They traveled over the telephone lines and they were subject to the non-discrimination requirements of Title II telecommunications, non-communication. This was embedded in the first in the in something called the end-to-end -end principle, which became one of the cornerstones of the design of the Internet Protocol. This paper published in 1981 um, by um, uh, three uh, of the uh, uh, computer scientists or considered to be founders um, or fathers of the Internet, who will Salter, uh, Reed, and Clark. Uh, who, uh, in this paper of the end-to-end -end principle, uh, explained that for the communication platform to be successful, uh, it should be the case that the network in the middle does not make judgments or distinctions among the traffic that is passed from one end user to another end user. This is why it was called the end-to-end -end principle. The idea is that you have the person on one end, you have the uh, other person on the other end, and what is in the middle is simply there to pass the information along from the one to the other at the control of either end, and that the network in the middle should not interpose itself. And even after we reclassify broad cable modem, broadband service as an information service, and then subsequently in 2005, reclassified all wireline 
service, cable and DSL, as an information service, we still maintain an important principle of non-discrimination and FCC oversight of the broadband network. In 2005, as part of the wireline framework, the FCC also adopted something called the Internet Policy Statement, which guaranteed to all Internet subscribers that they had a right to access all legal content on the Internet, to use all services that do not harm the network, and to connect any device which does not harm the network. Essentially, taking this end-to-end -end principle and applying it, even as an information service, to broadband. Why did we uh, not limit ourselves to that? Two reasons. One, uh, we began to have problems with broadband providers doing precisely what they claim they have never done or they will never do, blocking and degrading traffic. Uh, the most uh, important incident of this, which gained the most notoriety early on uh, in 2008, was the Comcast blocking of peer-to-peer -peer applications. Uh, that led to uh, an attempt to enforce the Internet Policy Statement in 2010, the D.C. Circuit ruled that the FCC could not enforce the uh, policy statement under the authority that it had cited at the time, which was something called ancillary authority. The FCC then proceeded to enact a new rule, this time relying upon the authority in Section 706 of the Telecommunications Act of 1996, now codified at 13 um, U.S.C. Uh, 13. Uh, uh, 01, 02, 03, and 04. Uh, again, the court struck the, uh, uh, these rules down in 2014, although it preserved some of the transparency requirements, with the observation that the FCC could not impose true neutrality upon a network, what we call common carriage, unless that network was a telecommunications um, service. The FCC, according to the D.C. Circuit, therefore had a choice. It could either allow for discrimination by networks, or it could reclassify broadband as a Title II telecommunications service. Those were the options that were available to the FCC. I will uh, add that during 2014, from 2014, January 2014, when the court decision was made until the uh, uh, 2015, when the uh, reclassification and new rules were announced, we had one of the largest and most widespread problems of net neutrality, which is shocking to me that people continue to gloss over this as if it never happened. Folks may recall that the major broadband providers, Comcast, Charter, Verizon, and AT&T, all proceeded to congest the traffic from Netflix, impacting not merely the Netflix traffic, but all other traffic, effectively in some cases reducing broadband connectivity at peak hours to less than 0.5 megabits per second download until Netflix agreed to pay an additional interconnection fee. Somehow, we are led to believe that not only will that never happen again, but it will somehow did not happen in the first place. But it is vitally important to remember that the reason why we uh, it, why we shifted to Title II and to such explicit um, rules of neutrality for broadband um, was to prevent what John Oliver famously described as cable, and I cannot complete the sentence because I am testifying before this all got by. Uh, but I do uh, urge folks who have forgotten this um, to simply go online while you still can download these sorts of things easily um, and uh, look for the video, John Oliver's 2014 net neutrality video to remind everyone that in fact what we saw the moment it was possible to do so were cable operators seeking to impose new charges upon uh, potential competitors, raising the cost of competitors without regard to the impact of this on their subscribers or to the network as a whole. There is much here that I could discuss, but let me focus on four specific areas of great concern. The cost to consumers, the cost to innovation and competition, the cost to democracy, and the cost of digital redlining in the absence of enforceable net neutrality rules. First, let me uh, discuss the cost to consumers. One is the fear that um, we will face new charges for new services. It is unlikely that internet uh, that broadband providers will seek to charge new fees for 
things that we receive now in the short term. It will be much easier going forward in the long term. And indeed, we saw an example of this in 2012 when AT&T attempted to limit the use of the application face time uh, on its phones to uh, only the highest uh, available subscription tier. Our organization, Public Knowledge, along with Free Press, filed a uh, net neutrality complaint with the FCC um, under the rules as they existed at that time. And the matter was settled, and AT&T was required to phase in face time across all of its mobile service contracts. I have no difficulty imagining that as we move to things like 4K video, um, that broadband providers will charge new fees for what are essentially these services. We've seen this not only, as I said, with FaceTime, but this is, in fact, the model of the cable industry for the primary providers of broadband. I will uh, ask anyone here who has seen their uh, uh, their cable bill to look at, for example, the digital charge. We have long since passed the conversion from standard definition television to digital television. And yet, cable operators continue to charge for the privilege of receiving digital, which is in fact the only transmission service. Cable operators incur a fee, an expense rather, to downgrade the, def the high definition digital uh, broadcast to standard definition if you don't pay because the business model of cable is to extract fees wherever they can. Technically, you can attach a cable modem, but anyone who has tried to do this with certain providers understands that that is hard to do. And again, fees are charged for these connecting services. We should not in the least doubt that in the absence of enforceable net neutrality rules, we will continue to see charges for uh, such things as home network connectivity, uh, 4K uh, video, or other new services as they become available will only become available at the cost of an additional charge. Now let me discuss the cost of innovation. One of the most famous uh, quotes with regard to the birth of the internet um, came in 1964 uh, when uh, an early innovator uh, attempting to develop a packet switch network uh, sought permission from AT&T to do so because at that time, before the FCC uh, opened the, the network in the computer proceedings, the uh, AT&T through its tariffing could control what traffic went over its network. The response from AT&T was, damn if we'll let you build a competitor over our own network. That has been the uh, essential uh, um, response of every network operator to every potential competitor when they are capable of doing so at the cost of innovation. Again, we look to the cable uh, experience and we can see that cable operators have essentially built their entire business on taking the innovations of others packaging it and then selling it back to you at a higher price. That was, they took broadcast television and uh, um, charged us, used that as the basis of their service to charge us for what used to be free. Uh, they, uh, um, we used to be able to purchase things like video uh, uh, recorders that plug directly into the television set. Once we converted to digital, the analog hole was closed and we now all have to rent the set-top boxes and pay an additional uh, um, EBR fee for things that 15 years ago we used to be able to do for ourselves and charge for ourselves. And all of this has been at the cost of innovation. EBR technology, which has hardly advanced since it was introduced back in uh, the late 90s and early 00s, and became subject entirely to the control of the cable network. I uh, took point to wireless before net neutrality. Uh, the, uh, in 2007, Tim Wu wrote an important paper called Wireless Carter Phone. Carter Phone refer, re, uh, refers to the uh, FCC uh, decision in 1968, which required um, the telephone network to allow anyone to attach uh, any device that does not harm the network to the network, um, in which he documented all of the, at that time, innovations that were available on mobile phones in Europe, which were not being made available to consumers in the United States because the wireless network providers simply refused to allow potential competing services on their networks. 
Again, we have no reason to believe that this will not be the case, and every reason um, to believe that uh, uh, this will uh, be the case without net neutrality. I've already referenced the, uh, um, the uh, imposition of additional charges on uh, the attempt to impose additional charges on Netflix um, through congestion of links in 2014 um, during the period of time when the rules were struck down by the DC Circuit. Um, the, uh, uh, but uh, additionally, um, if uh, the past is prologue, uh, we can uh, expect to see uh, similar efforts made uh, now that net neutrality uh, has been uh, removed. But while this is a cost to innovation and a cost of competition to services uh, that are uh, uh, provided by the broadband network provider, uh, there is also a broader uh, loss of competition in the general economy. This is the large versus small problem. Right now, any business that can actually get online and transmit, uh, you know, uh, and have a customer download um, their uh, um, their uh, service or their video advertisement or whatever it is, um, is able to experience uh, the same experience uh, whether they are uh, accessing a national company or a local company. Uh, there is a reason why the National Association of Independent Realtors has been a long-term supporter of net neutrality and an opponent to the effort to uh, uh, repeal these rules. Let us assume that we have simply paid prioritization on the other side. National, to take just a simple example, national realtors can afford to pay for prioritization of things like 4K video to provide guided tours of all of these uh, um, uh, of uh, uh, their uh, properties and can afford to do so on a national basis. Local realtors simply cannot. There is no way a local realtor who is attempting to offer video uh, of uh, properties in Vermont uh, from somebody uh, in, uh, to somebody in Vermont um, or even, dare I suggest, across the border in New Hampshire and Massachusetts, I'm from Boston originally, so I understand what a trip that is, um, who are looking for uh, these properties, they will experience in this world of prioritization slow, non-loadable video from local businesses attempting to, uh, um, to compete with large national chains which will be able to afford the prioritization. Finally, uh, let me talk now about cost to democracy and what uh, I call digital redlining. Everyone who has been elected to office understands the problem of campaign finance and the need for campaign finance reform. What drives up the cost of running for office? It's the need to advertise, the need to advertise over the public airwaves, um, which, although we have a form of neutrality for at least for federal candidates in the Communications Act, um, allows essentially for prioritization in the sense that um, you can charge more for prime time uh, um, advertising. Um, if you want to run for office advertising only to people who are watching at 4 a.m., it is much cheaper um, than if you are trying to run uh, for office to people who watch during the prime time hours, but also far less effective. And so, as we have seen, this has had not only a uh, uh, ongoing uh, impact uh, on the cost of campaigns, but as a consequence has made it increasingly difficult for ca independent candidates, for uh, those who have issues um, that they wish to uh, notify the public who are not running for office, all of which driven by this non, uh, uh, simply by the increasing cost of what is effectively prioritization of time on the airway. Until now, the internet has been a oasis of democracy in the sense that once I'm on, other people can see what I am putting out there, can read what I am reading without these additional charges. I'm not going to pretend that money doesn't matter. Obviously, a well-funded candidate capable of producing a high-quality video is certainly more likely uh, um, to be successful in transmitting their uh, uh, message than uh, somebody like myself sitting uh, in front of a camera for a YouTube video. But the fact is that for the first time uh, since we uh, entered the age of the electronic media, it was at least possible 
for those without enormous resources to compete on a level playing field for those who had far more significant resources. Net neutrality and the absence of net neutrality, rather, is repeal and the allowance of paid prioritization, even if that paid prioritization is allowed on an equal basis, that is to say, I make the same cost of prioritization available to anybody, um, you know, deprives us of what has been a very, an increasingly important avenue for democratic discourse and a means of circumventing the bottlenecks that are caused by the high cost of advertising and political speech. Finally, I will touch on what I call digital redlining. Paid prioritization assumes that people actually want to reach you. One of the uh, problems, as we all know from our daily lives, is some subscribers, some customers are considered to be more valuable than others. Sometimes this rests on stereotypes um, with regard to uh, uh, race or gender and potential spending uh, um, or um, you know, uh, pocket money. Other times it is simply uh, um, an economic analysis of who, can, who are worth advertising to and who are not worth advertising to. But in any event, we all know from our daily life experiences that we do not experience the real world in the same and equal way. That those of us who have more means those of us who uh, do not come from traditional and marginalized communities are offered a far greater array of services and are advertised to far more eagerly than those who are not. Until now, the internet has not worked that way. With the repeal of net neutrality, we will see the same thing. Advertisers will wish to prioritize their uh, content and their services on the basis of who can afford to pay and who are the desirable customers. This is economics. It, this unfortunate new world which we are creating, over time we can expect the experience that people will have online to be markedly different. Not because they lack access to an internet provider themselves, but because those who are others who are online, whether they are commercial services, whether they are advertisers, whoever they may be, simply do not consider these people to be as profitable, as worthwhile to reach as those in areas, wealthier zip codes, uh, more desirable demographics for whom they will pay to prioritize content delivered to them. Thank you uh, for this opportunity to testify. I uh, believe there is one point that I should address in light of the last uh, uh, witness, uh, which is, um, as I have observed, we've had a principle of net neutrality and end-to-end -end, uh, um, built into the network since its beginning. Uh, the argument that network neutrality somehow interferes with the ability to uh, manage networks is simply and demonstrably false. It has been untrue um, since 2000. You know, it has uh, uh, never interfered with the ability to manage networks. All of the rules include very clear exceptions for, quote, reasonable network management. Um, the limitations uh, include a limitation on any device, attachment of any device which would harm the network, attachment of any service that would harm the network. So the argument that, well, we couldn't shut down a rogue camera spewing out traffic um, because we're not allowed to, to, we wouldn't be allowed to interfere, is simply false effect and a deliberate misleading uh, reading of uh, the law as uh, it was previously written. Uh, and to which, frankly, um, we should return. So I thank you for this opportunity to testify and I invite your questions at this time. Okay. Questions? I am wondering, do we have written testimony from you? Yes. Yes. Unfortunately, I was only contacted about this uh, um, uh, within the last uh, uh, day and a half. I asked if written testimony was required. I was told it was not required, and I regret that I have not had the opportunity to submit to, uh, uh, to prepare written testimony. <clears throat> if you could email that to Cheryl, our assistant who contacted you, we will put that up online. Uh, under all the committee submissions. If you, yeah. you, know, if you can't, that's fine, but I, I think yeah. you had a lot to say, and I think it would be helpful if the committee could read it 
and have some time to digest it because you, you gave us a lot of information. Um, I'll, I'll do what I can. Uh, I can't guarantee it will be word for word since I get uh, um, uh, that, work from a, rather than from a written speech, but I'll do the best that I can. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay. I think there are no other questions. I actually have a question. Oh, you have a question. Okay. So I've been ah, taught, taught not to ask questions I don't know the answers to. As opposed, as opposed to on the center floor, I'm not allowed to ask questions I know the answer to, which I learned. He wants, uh, to, he wants you to identify yourself. Oh, um, my name is Michael Sirak. I'm a senator for Sydney <coughs> County. And um, when, in 2015, when um, the FCC uh, decided that these companies, the ISPs, were part of telecommunication, I'm guessing there might have been some litigation after that. You're you're quite right, and uh, it is worth noting that uh, the ISPs uh, appealed this decision to uh, the Federal Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. Um, the uh, FCC was uh, um, decision was upheld um, in uh, June of 2016. Um, the D.C. Circuit uh, and subsequently uh, rejected. Um, the uh, petition uh, for rehearing on bonk, um, the uh, uh, petition for um, uh, certiorari remain pending uh, at the Supreme Court um, as these things went their way rather uh, slowly. But um, the uh, um, the FCC's decision has indeed been uh, upheld uh, uh, by the uh, Court of Law, and uh, um, you know I. Frankly, and doubtful that uh, the Supreme Court would be interested in hearing this case. So, a prior witness from AT and T said they didn't like the legal basis for the decision, but as of now, it's been upheld by the Court of Appeals. That's correct. And what the, the and what the telecommunications companies have said um, is that they specifically do not like Title II um, of the Communications Act of 1934. Now. This is a very important point for two reasons. First of all, as the D.C. Circuit made clear in rejecting the FCC's 2014 rules, you either classified broadband as a Title II service or you couldn't have net neutrality. Uh, the reason for that is that the Communications Act um, contains a provision which says um, a common carrier may only be regulated um, as a uh, common carrier to the extent um, that it offers uh, common carrier service, uh, meaning that if services that are offered that are not common carrier service, those cannot be regulated as if they were common carrier service. Uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, excuse me, I'm going to uh, forgive me for cutting you off, but because I asked the question, but um, we have a lot of witnesses here, and uh, I think we're getting into, we're getting into the weeds a little bit of legal theory. So. Um, you can add it to your written testimony. If you okay, like. and we do have um, several handouts that are on our website. So, any Thank you. I, you send in. I may just be permitted to make one point, one one further point about Title II. Okay. Um, the primary reason that the telecommunications companies have objected to it is because Title II is designed to ensure, in the words of the Communications Act, that all Americans have access on a for, at affordable rates. To telecommunication services. These ISPs fear Title II precisely for the reason that we need it. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. All right. Um, I think, committee, I'm going to go to Jeffrey Austin next, if that's all right, and then we'll have all the visiting testimony, and then we have. Um, the, the Department of Public Service and Maria Royal that are in-house staff or in-state staff and they're to talk to us if that works. Okay. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, for the record, uh, Jeff Austin from Fairpoint Communications. I'm the Director of Government Relations and External Affairs. Um, thank you for uh, letting me testify today. I appreciate the time. I, there's, that's a lot, there's a lot, obviously, to um, um, 
to think about uh, through whether we're talking that. yeah <laughs> internet privacy um, certainly net neutrality I've been in a couple other sessions when, we, when there's been testimony or discussion about um, H-289 and I've had some background uh, in the company I've been with the company 24 years with engineering with sales engineering and network design and I thought I would I would, if I can, uh, with your permission, I'd like to take this back a little bit and just talk a little bit more about the internet. What is it? How does it work? How does an ISP interact? What is our responsibility? And what's and, and how do to, how do that things actually work? How does your browser work? How do your how do cookies work? How do you know when something comes up on Amazon when you're on your Facebook? Just on a high level. I mean, there's a lot to it, and there's a lot of communication that happens. And I thought this might be helpful for the committee. I know it will be helpful. For Chair. So I will, I'll start with just basic internet, um, ISPs, stop me anytime um, if you have any questions about this. But um, so the idea, just to make a couple easy analogies, um, when it comes to an ISP, internet service provider, it's our, we're the last mile we connect end users to the World Wide Web, the internet, uh, which is a worldwide collection of interconnected computer networks that use a certain protocol which regulate the rules and the language that speaks to get you from point A to point B. So to break that down, so we connect you, we, we use DSL service to your house, you have a modem that's connected to your computers. We, that modem is connected to our network. That network is very similar to the interstate system um, that connects people, physically connects people, and gets people from point A to point B. That's our responsibility, is when you virtually want to go somewhere, you type in a, an address, www.amazon.com and it's our responsibility to get you there and so you have a virtual meeting. It's similar to AOT's responsibility on the interstate to make sure you have clear access from point A to point B to get you to, and I think their previous witness mentioned, this is, a, this is an A to B transaction. We as, a, as an ISP are in the middle of that to get you to that A to B transaction. So ultimately, those roads in Vermont, get you to where, if I want to go to Swanton House Pizza, where I'm from, get pizza, <coughs> travel from South Burlington on the road to get go to Swanton House Pizza. That's my interaction uh, to get from point A to point B. Similar if I was going on www.com to Swanton House Pizza. If I wanted to go out of the state, um, very similar to the bridge going in Lebanon, New Hampshire. That bridge is a network to network interface in the virtual world. We have connectivity to different companies and different carriers to get you, because Amazon is an in Vermont. Amazon's servers and all of their network reside somewhere else. So in that, the clouds. yes, in the cloud. So that physical bridge in Lebanon is the AOT's connection to hand you off to the New Hampshire Agency of Transportation. Our network to network interface is our virtual connection to get you to the rest of the world. You know, we have our network, that network is limited within the scope of Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont. Uh, we have connectivity in 24 states, but that there's an internet gateway that you connect to that connects you to the companies that connect to the rest of the world. So that's ultimately that responsibility of whether it's AOT getting you there safely or your internet service provider getting you from point A to point B. So that, and again, that's just a very high level kind of analogy on, on kind of some of that responsibility. Now, there's your computer, your tablet, your cell phone, um, whatever you happen to be using your laptop, those are all the devices that you're interfacing with to get to the World Wide Web. Um, just as, you know, if you're going to, you're hopping in your car and you're going to Swanson House Pizza. Um, ultimately, we know as consumers that there's, there's a lot of consumer responsibility when you go on any website, when you, when you travel anywhere. It's your, you should know where you're going, who you're dealing with, um, and and how to protect yourself in those kind of in those kind of situations. So there's it's heavy on you know consumer responsibility, but it's also it's still a relationship between one consumer and let's say a business because that's a lot of that. Uh, even if it's Facebook, even and, you know Amazon things like that. So when you're really talking about um, that relationship, I've got, I do go to Swanton House of Pizza and I drive there and I get a pizza and they overcharge me. That's not a responsibility of the person of the of the. Um, of the route that you took to get there. The same thing is if you go to Amazon and they overcharge you for something, that's, a, that's you and Amazon's doing, um, doing commerce, basically. And anything that happens, you guys would deal with it kind of on a point-to-point -point basis. The ISP, again, is, is that middle person getting you from point A to point B. 
Now, that doesn't mean that there's not a security over there. Well, before I kind of get into security, in order to figure out kind of what's secure, how, how you secure it, or what you, what you can pass, what you have to pass to make the internet work. The internet works on uh, transport connection protocol and internet protocol. That's how the internet works. It's a language, it's rules, it's protocols that are, um, I'm not gonna say regulated, but are, you have, you have several different groups of folks who are involved in creating these protocols and making sure when you're looking to go somewhere virtually, like Amazon, that you have the language correct through your computer, then through the routing system, and then through your physical connection that is connected to your ISP. Then we transport that information um, over small packets. So let's say you're going to you you are you're shopping and you buy a, you buy a sweater on Amazon. Your where your computer is taking that information and it's putting it into packets. Those packets go to your internet connection and ride over that internet connection to Amazon where that packet is deconstructed and your data is in there. Now, those packets are very, very small. So when you're typing and you're ordering something and you're putting your credit card and your name and your social security number, your date of birth, whatever you want to put on there, all of that is separated into different packets. And those packets can take completely different ways around the world and not around the world, I'll say around the country to be more realistic, to get there. One packet with some of that data is gonna go from router one, two, three, four, right to Amazon. The other one's gonna go two, eight, 12, 14, right to Amazon. Every packet is, pri is prioritized over the network to get to the shortest path. That packet includes your IP address, your destination, and your source IP address, because it's based on IP addresses. Your IP address is like your telephone number. Um, that's basically, it identifies you. You go through domain name servers, domain, domain, uh, domain name servers are like the telephone books that says this IP belongs to this domain name. That's basically how everything talks to each other is with IP addresses. So when you're talking about privacy, that IP address over the ISP network to the network to network connection through the routers that get to your end location, you have you have your IP addresses, source, destination, where it came from, where it's going. All the routers have routing tables. And they just go through a series of, okay, where are you coming from? Where are you going? And how do we get you to the next stop? And to the next stop. Ultimately, back ultimately to Amazon. And ultimately, the way that the transport protocol works, it verifies that you have the, all the right pieces. Because like I said, all those packets could go in all different directions to ultimately get put back together in the right order. You can imagine that doesn't happen all the time. So the way that the, the whole network works is it says, hey, I didn't get this one. You know, there's five pieces of info. I didn't get number four, resend it. That connection is working. You have a session initiated. It resends the information. So when just wanted to kind of review a little bit of that. We can go, there's a lot more firewalls, you know, when you're talking about ISP security. We have, we have a large network, now we have a lot of users. We wanna make sure that, that that interstate is clear so people can get from point A to point B with their information, it gets there accurately, um, and that we're, that we're obviously protecting the information with firewalls and we don't, there's things called denial of service attacks. People are you know, always trying to get into, um, into your computers. You guys have heard of hacking, you know, hack, hacking, spam, um, malware, spyware. There's so many software applications out there where people are ultimately trying, to, like viruses, trying to get into your computer to try to get information. Antivirus protection, you know, shutting off your modem, protection, you know, personal security over your, over your computers. Obviously, it's a, it's a big deal when you're talking about going on the internet. So, it's just a little bit about when you're talking, when you're talking internet privacy, there's a lot of privacy if I'm, going to, if I'm going to subscribe to a security service, you know, and that security service goes over my internet. I have to be confident that the person I'm subscribing with, you know, the person I'm subscribing that security service with is somebody who's going to protect my data. They're the ones who have my credit card information. They're the ones who have my name, my address, and whatever other information was necessary to, you know, to order the service and to build the service. So that's... You know, there's a, there's a lot more. I have a lot of stuff written here just about kind of how that traffic goes and the security and 
Again, those IP addresses are in every packet because that IP address is related to your um, is related to your location at home. When you're talking about residential, you know, uh, you know, most of our customers are resi residential services. Those customers use dynamic IP addresses, which means every time you turn your modem on, you get a different IP address. You, uh, there's companies, larger companies, more corporate, want static IPs because static IPs let them configure their routers and their network with the same IP all the time, and it just helps them manage their network a lot easier. For our purposes, when we go on the internet and browse, we don't care what our IP address is. Um, so it can change every single time. So there's no distinguishable identification regarding your IP address, because it, like I said, it can, it's dynamic, it can change any time. Um, one thing just for your purposes is it's not a bad idea to shut off your modem or your router or, your, or whatever it is every once in a while, um, just to shut things down. Because if your modem's working and your cell phone is on and your tablet's on, there's data going through those all the time. You know, if somebody's, if somebody's out there and they're trying to hack into, into the system, if your modem's on and your tablet's on, things are, there's still stuff that's going on in the background. So just as a security part of it, that's just something that's helpful. If you have your antivirus, you know, if, you're, if your equipment is upgraded, that's really helpful to protect yourself when you're not online. Uh, but when you still are online, and I know that can be confusing, but again, there's still data circling all over your all over this equipment, um, even though you're not on there typing www.amazon.com. Um, one thing that I thought might be helpful, you, there's um, internet browsers. Um, you have Mozilla Firefox, you have um, Google Chrome, you have Internet Explorer, you have on Apple Safari. A lot of people you, you have a lot of people use browsers to get to where they want to go. Your email, maybe your home page, whatever it may be. When you're on the internet and you go to a certain uh, internet website, um, it, this kind of gets into that idea that how do people know what your, what your browsing habits are? How do people know what you're looking at? There's internet cookies and you know that are, so basically an internet cookie is a small file that gets put on your hard drive through your browser when you go to a website. Um, that file may, there's no personal information on that file. Uh, that file is, your brow, is basically browsing habits. You went to this website, you looked at this sweater, you looked at these pair of shoes, and then that's what you have on that browser. The browsers help, you know, those cookies help when you go to Amazon again, that you could, keep, you could be signed in automatically. If you go back to Amazon after you shut your computer off and you see things that are still in your cart, that's because the cookies said, hey, by the way, I know who this person is, and, you know, and they have some stuff in their cart. So there's a lot of stuff when it comes to that. Again, going back to your computer and the security, there's you can disable cookies. You can disable third-party cookies, which is when you go to Amazon, there might be people advertising on Amazon, and those people may also put those files on your computer to figure out what you're doing to advertise. Now, this is a big, this is a big business, um, internet advertising of information. Um, they don't need to know your personal information. They don't know who, who they don't need to know who you are. Um, but you know when they're looking they know at where I shop. yeah, they know I exactly. And a lot of so that data is going back and forth constantly when you're talking about the internet. Our responsibility is to make sure that data flows back and forth. Again, when you're talking about cookies, um, there's no customer data in those cookies. It's not your name or address or telephone number. This is just you know this is just what do you do when you're on the internet. Um, there's also something interesting that every device you have, every device you have here has a MAC address. Um, a MAC address is a specific um, identifier for your devices. So with, you know, with, between MAC addresses, even if you change your IP address every day on your internet, um, you know, the MAC address is embedded in the packets that you send in that source IP you know, address and your destination IP address. So as we're trying to keep that interstate open, and trying to keep every you know all that data going through, one of the things it's impossible to open every one of those packets and verify where it's going. Is there any intent? Is there any bad intent? Going back to the interstate um, kind of um, equation, it would be like having like forty thousand state troopers on the interstate stopping every vehicle and just searching it and making sure that there was no you know legal you know the idea is to keep the data flowing, have 
our firewalls in place, have our security in place to make sure that data is going back and forth in a, in a, in a standard, you know, using the right language, um, and it's working properly. Um, and so there's a lot to that. There's a lot to cookies. There's a lot to, uh, and again, I'm just focusing on just internet security um, at this point. Uh, but there's just a lot of data out there. When it comes to CPNI, customer network proprietary information, um, we use, we collect just like every customer, if somebody wants to subscribe to our service, name, address, phone number, we use it for billing purposes. Um, and, and we share that information for other carriers. If somebody ordered something through them, that gets billed for us. But the customer proprietary uh, network information, uh, that's not your internet. You know, like I said, that's really your browser is kind of figuring out where you're going, what you're doing, and with the websites and the way that the cookies work. That's kind of how you guys, that's kind of how people figure out what your internet browsing, um, you know, history is, uh, basically. So, but on the CPNI, you know, like as an ISP, well, one, we don't know where you're going. You know, we're not tracking every packet or an information of what you have in, in that you bought a sweater or you sent your social security number to TurboTax or whatever it happens to be. A lot of those websites, when you get to the point of putting billing information in it, they're using security software, uh, they're using secu security protocols like Secure Socket Layer. You'll see a little like lock in the bottom right that says, oh, hey, I'm supposed to say, mean I'm secure. You know, you're over a secure session between, you know, with that company. And when you put in your credit card number, you should have a high sense of comfort that that information is going over a secure, uh, going over a secure connection. But there's also, the, you know, there's also a responsibility. I'll just give you one anecdote. I got an email from Bank of America the other day, and I clicked on, there was a link, I clicked on it, and it brought me to the Bank of America's homepage. Well, I have no idea where that, e that email came from, but when I, when I click on it, it says Bank of America, the URL says Bank of America. That still, it was not Bank of America's website. I could have put all my information in there and sent it, but it wasn't for Bank of America. It was a spam email. Um, there's a, it's a wonderful and, and dangerous place all at the same time. And I just, like I said, I know there's been a lot of discussion. I just wanted to kind of take it back a little bit and just talk a little bit about the internet and the general browsing and kind of how that works and, and hope that it would be helpful in the discussions of internet privacy and, um, and I just want to see if there's anything else that I wanted to put on. No, like I said, we don't, this, this information, the ISPs, we're not, it's not, we're not, in, we're not in business to share that information, to market it, to advertise. That is a, a crazy business of the World Wide Web. Um, and a lot of folks, there's a lot of internet advertising companies that, um, that focus on that, on that advertising of your history, of your browser history. But, um, not something that uh, that the ISPs are taking and selling. We use a, we still have we have pages of CPNI requirements regarding security that we don't share our information. We don't sell it. We don't market it. Um, you know regarding your phone networks, your billing information, um, and your browsing. You know and your browsing tendencies. You know with the internet, we're just taking the information. You type it in. We send it along in merry way. You're not from behind the cookies. We're not behind the cookies. We didn't create them. They've been around a long time. Um, and if you guys are curious, if you're in a browser, you can go to the settings. You might have to go to advanced settings. And in there is embedded um, enable or block third-party cookies. Not a bad idea. Um, and you can block all cookies if you wanted to. Um, if you do block cookies, the only thing that happens is if you do go to Amazon, you may not see what you have in your shopping cart the last time you went. It just more. I think you get on the MLS, I have to have cookies. You, and some sites require cookies to be. I know I've been instructed to turn them on. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you. Helpful. Okay. I think I'm watching the clock and I'm trying to avoid information overload here. I think the networks are getting a little. Where's Grace? Oh, there you are. Um, I'm trying to decide if it's how long are you? Have you got a presentation? Or are you just here because we asked you to be here? <laughs> All right, you want to know what we want to know? 
Uh, probably more the latter. I don't have okay. a presentation. Um, uh, just discuss the issues generally. Um, I'm happy to come back if, if you do uh, and take a break. Or well, Committee of Thinking, we're scheduled to take a break between 3 and 4. Maria, if we take a 15-minute break, will that? Can that work for you? Sure. Can that work for you? I just have a sense that we're, we're in overload at this point. Probably could use just a few minutes to decompress and let everything set in. And then, so committee be back at 3. And we'll um, get this going. Okay. 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 Yeah. Maria? Did you know I don't even think I've upgraded? Oh. Oh. I think I was. I remember that email. I don't use this up because I have to think. It's probably unlocked. It's probably unlocked. Yeah, I actually have a page. I don't. Can I have it this way? Here we go. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Michael. Michael for blocking. Yeah, you gotta pay more to have that's right. You gotta pay Michael to get your papers. No, if it goes that way, you pay more. If it goes this way, especially if you have a <laughs> Rather than just the usual. Yeah, all right. True time. Let's not make the microphone stand up and salute or set off the emergency button. Okay, Maria. Okay. Okay, see if you can make this simple. I'll try. Maria Royal, Legislative Council, and I did try to distill a lot of complicated information um, into just some key points that cover a pretty broad scope of information. So I'll just tell you in advance what's covered in here, and we can go at whatever pace uh, you want. We don't have to get into the details. It might be just a good reference point for you as you hear things. Um, so I start by just going over some of the terminology, who the key players are in the internet ecosystem. I go over the federal and state regulatory landscape um, a little bit so you're aware of that context. Talk about some of the key provisions of the overarching federal communications law, Communications Act of 1934, as well as some of the changes that came about in 1996. And then uh, a little bit more detail about net neutrality, uh, its kind of early incarnation, and then uh, the different attempts to regulate and what's happened there, leading up to the most recent order by the FCC. And then probably uh, significantly for your purposes, uh, what all of this means for the states and what kind of authority, if any, you have to legislate in the area of net neutrality. Um, and then I have one more slide on privacy because I know we've also talked about internet privacy and I don't know where the committee would like to go. So that's, there's, like I said, a lot here, but it might be more of a reference point that you can use uh, as you're considering this issue. So. I like things in nice books. Yeah. This looks like something, like something I can digest. Great. Great. Okay. I'm still working on everything else I've heard today. So we'll just start with the terminology. Um, and you're familiar with these terms, so I'm not going to read them in detail. But just so, again, we understand who we're talking about and what we're talking about. Broadband Internet Access Service, EIAS. That is the service that's being or regulated or deregulating, deregulated by the FCC. So when we talk about net neutrality, we talk about that internet service and to what extent it's managed. Um, the service is offered by the internet service provider, the ISPs. They can be wired or wireless. They provide uh, the connection to the internet or the transmission line. Okay, so these are the poles and wires providers. 
these are the wires or wireless. These, this is how you connect to the internet. It's the transmission line. The data flows. An ISP provides. Right. So for there's some examples here, just again to kind of keep it real. Your inner the providers in Vermont, Comcast, Charter, Verizon, AT&T, EC Fiber, HughesNet, satellite provider. All of those entities are the internet providers in Vermont. Okay. So then uh, there's reference to what are called edge providers. These are the people that provide uh, the content, the software, the applications um, over the internet. These could be uh, your service, your streaming services like Netflix or Hulu, um, social network programs like Facebook, web browsers like Google. YouTube would be in here. YouTube, yep, all of the content providers. So you have the transmission line, so to speak, and then you have the entities that are doing business over or providing information over the lines. Those are the edge providers. They have something that they're offering on the internet. And then, of course, the end users are the customers, um, people like you and I who use the internet for various purposes. And then I included data broker that's sort of beyond the scope of where we're going, but just because it's a term that often comes up in the connection, particularly with privacy. Data brokers do not have a connection, a direct connection with end users, but they do collect personal information and they sell it for marketing purposes. So you heard Chris Curtis and Senator Sorokin talk about the data broker privacy report that was just recently submitted. Um, they are also now, based on the legislative charge, working on a privacy report that's specific to internet service providers. So they did the first half, and now they're working on privacy related to the ISPs. And that's due December 18th, or December this year. So that pretty much, when people talk about the internet ecosystem, these are the, these are the primary players that they're referencing. So in terms of uh, regulation and the major regulatory entities at the federal level, the FCC primarily is the entity um, that regulates all communications, interstate communications. Um, it was founded in 1934 under the Communications Act regulates things, radio, television, television, phone industries, um, et cetera, to the extent they're common carriers. The FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, has a much broader scope of regulating uh, business practices. It's not limited to uh, you know, specific communications entities, for example. In fact, it's specifically um, not allowed to regulate common carriers. That's left to the FCC, Communications Commission. But it does have broader authority to regulate business practices, particularly uh, unfair, anti-competitive, deceptive. It's very much like, and you'll see on the next page, um, the, the authority that the Attorney General has in Vermont under the Consumer Protection Act. Okay, so if you think of it in those terms, so if you go to the next page, you'll see I put uh, Vermont Attorney General Consumer Protection Act. It's kind of the, it's the distinction between consumer protection issues on the one hand and economic regulations on the other, although it's not always a clear distinction. Um, but in terms of the state entity that regulates communications or telecommunication services, as you all know, Public Utility Commission. Um, I don't think we have to go over some of the references in there, at least not at this point. So as I mentioned, uh, the overarching federal law that's kind of controlling what's happening right now to a great extent is the Communications Act of 1934. Yes. I have a quick question about the Sherman Act and monopolistic practices. So yes. Is, this, is that 
would that be, <clears throat> suppose uh, our attorney general were going to act against uh, uh, internet uh, provider service in this state for monopolistic practices. I'm thinking of Ma Bell years ago. Would that have been, would conceptually, could that have started at a state level, or does it have to be a federal? Um, I think, I believe, my understanding is it could start in the state level, that this would provide a state remedy for alleged antitrust issues. If it's a big enough company, it might be removed from the federal courts, but that it's complementary authority that the, at the state level we can enforce the same basic provisions if that the SEC so. can. Okay. There may be other jurisdictional issues, but right. the authority is, is there. Is okay. there is some more thing. So just briefly um, about the Communications Act of 1934, because there really has been a big shift in policy, and it's, I think it's important to understand where this all started, the regulation of communications. Um, so this law created the FCC um, and charged it with overseeing and regulating interstate communications. At the time, um, there was a very kind of monopolistic, sanctioned monopolistic approach to telecommunications. You had the local phone companies, much like you still have today, um, although it's being deregulated. Uh, you, have, you have the phone companies, they have a service territory, they're the monopoly provider, um, but the states can regulate the, pri the prices um, to ensure that they reflect a competitive price and the, and the services. So that was pretty much the market back then when the original law um, was enacted at the congressional level. And significantly, most of the communications at the time were intrastate, so states actually had a much uh, more, uh, a greater interest and investment in regulating so the local the markets. local phone service yeah. could be state regulated. Intrastate, in, yes. But inter, an interstate was the feds. Yes. So I'm calling, that was the long distance. Yes, and, the long distance. and that stayed the same. That is has not changed. Um, trying to make a distinction between what is interstate and what is interstate has become much more complicated with the different technologies, but we'll talk about that a little bit. So uh, one more thing, this is very basic. On the next page about the Communications Act, you always hear references to the various titles. The original act was divided into titles, so you'll, you hear about Title I, when we talk about uh, information services uh, should be regulated under Title I, which is more, there isn't as much authority for the FCC over information services under Title I. Um, it reflects more of a light touch, what's called a light touch regulatory approach, as opposed to when you see references to Title II, they're talking about the FCC's common carrier regulations, much more utility style regulations over the phone companies basically. And then of course the other titles which um, are also uh, relevant here, Title VI pertains to the cable companies, Title III to the radio which includes the cellular companies. So that's just a snapshot of why the references to those titles and what they mean. So then uh, just Significantly, and obviously there's a lot in between, but in terms of the major first overhaul of federal uh, law and policy came about in 1996 with the Telecommunications Act at that time. And that was, uh, the act um, amended the Communications Act and really uh, did it in a way to promote uh, competition and begin the process of deregulating um, the industry. Not just the phone industry, but also at that time, you now had these advanced telecommunication services or enhanced services, which then became known as information services, um, which is what we're talking about today. Internet access, is it an information service? Uh, which 
Congress, specifically at this time, thought should be uh, left to flourish and grow in a competitive market and not have any regulation? Or is it a telecommunication service where there's still some utility style regulation? So this, this was kind of the beginning of the deregulation and of the convergence of communications with computer, computerized technology. And that's, you'll see as the two converge, the regulatory authority um, gets a little bit more complicated. Um, so I kind of already talked about um, this on the next page that I'm going to, the difference between the two classifications, the major classifications under the federal law, the Title I and the Title II. And again, it's significant because how you classify a service will trigger the scope of regulatory authority that the FCC and the states have over that service. Um, and I just you know, put down here a quote from a 2014 federal case. Since the advent of the internet, the commission has confronted the questions of whether and how it should regulate this communications network. It has been an ongoing, highly contentious debate. I'll just leave it at that. And you'll see, uh, you can already get a sense of that from where we are now. Is, is there any um, either in or out depending on how you define the service under the FCC or the elements of the FCC jurisdiction that could cover you? Uh, I'm not sure. Well, the whole decision to, to um, move them out by the, the new administration <coughs> and say they're covered by the FTC, is there any remaining jurisdiction? That's an excellent question, and I think uh, not everyone agrees on what what has the FCC actually retained. If it's if the jurisdiction is pretty much going to the FTC, what is their scope of their authority? And I'm not sure if that's clear yet. In the order, uh, they talk about retaining the authority to remove barriers to market entry. So if there are internet providers uh, that want to enter the market. And if there are state barriers, potentially they have the authority to preempt those state measures. But it's kind of unchartered territory. Um, so, I, yeah. Okay. So, in terms of the shifts in policy, um, I think it's helpful to just think in terms of what the major factors are that influence uh, the decisions that are being made. One, obviously, uh, the market with all of the growth in telecommunications. Um, we've seen several things. We've seen uh, consolidation, a lot of mergers and acquisitions, uh, companies buying up uh, infrastructure, and that becomes relevant because that may impact uh, consumer's ability to have choices in different providers. So there may have been many providers in a region, but as companies grow and, and buy smaller companies, just in terms of the infrastructure, your options become limited as a consumer. And then also, in the sense of vertical integration, uh, where uh, access internet providers are buying or being bought by content providers. <coughs> so now they're not only giving you the access, but they want to sell you a streaming service or a news service. And so that's creating a, um, some of the conflict, conflict of interest. Some people are concerned about that that's a little too much control, that their companies might uh, be gatekeepers and might influence the traffic and where you go. That's open for debate. Companies say, no, they're not going to do that. That's bad for their bottom line. But that's the. Would an, would an example of that be Comcast's acquisition of NBC? Mm -hmm. Okay. And I, I, yeah, I can't really talk about what, what the practices are, what they've done. No, so no, I, no, I, no, I know. Absolutely. But that's yeah. absolutely right. Or the concern yes. is there. But the, you own one news service, and there's 
three others, you might be tempted if you have to make a network slow down to allow things to go through to favor one over the yeah. other. And there's While the certainly pizzeria, the I might yeah. want to put up a roadblock on that interstate <laughs> to the exit to Swanton if I wanted you to go to mm -hmm. the Underhill Pizzeria. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that's the concern that people are looking at. If you did that, you'd be really lost. <laughs> I know it. <laughs> right? And my daughter would be really mad because I'm sure she goes to the Swanton Pizzeria. Yeah, right. you get from Underhill to Swanton. <laughs> Can't get there from here. You can't get there. Um, the Montreal pizzerias. So, uh, so those, those are some of the market factors, and then obviously the technology evolving rapidly in terms of its capabilities and its functions, which is related to the next factor, the usage, uh, what we use it for, not just you know checking the weather. Obviously, it's become integrated into our lives and. Which is why people are concerned, obviously, about having access to the service. So then, more specifically, um, about net neutrality. What is net neutrality? <coughs> this is kind of the simplest and most basic statement that I found, description. Net neutrality is the principle that the company that connects you to the internet does not get to control what you do on the internet. And in terms of the practices uh, that the FCC um, and now states have thought about to ensure that there is no um, management of, of your use, uh, things like blocking and uh, the FCC's open internet order, these are all things that were in the original and the second open internet order. Um, no blocking, you can't block websites um, or applications, software that an end user wants to access. Um, no throttling, throttling we talked about is slowing down or degrading the quality of service. Paid prioritization, um, the fast lanes, the slow lanes, charging edge providers more to get their uh, information to the consumers. Um, and then there's kind of a general, it's been called a general standard of internet conduct. Um, there should be no unreasonable interference with, or just, I don't think disadvantaging is a word, but I was in a hurry, um, of an end users or edge providers use of the internet, and then also disclosure requirements. That these standards are set by whom, or these are So just these standards are the standards of the FCC in its open internet order uh, that's now being repealed, um, set for it. Thank you. Yep, that's kind of important. And they're all subject to, you heard Mr. Starro talking about reasonable network management practices. So there's always going to be some you know, managing the traffic. Um, the question is, is it being done for a, an anti-competitive business purpose or is it a legitimate network management? And so that's kind of gonna be the tension there. So in terms of the history of net neutrality, these again are just some highlights. I'm by no means an expert, um, but I, I do think it helps in terms of understanding the context. If there is, a, much longer history than I realized. Mm -hmm. um, basically going back uh, all the way to the 1970s uh, when you had were what were then called enhanced services on the network, electronic data processing services um, that were used over the phone lines. Um, so that could be things like voicemail services and even in these early stages of the development of those services, uh, the FCC had what was basically <coughs> the precursor to net neutrality, which was open access. The phone company that owns the phone line cannot uh, keep enhanced services off of their line. They have to, uh, you know, they can't discriminate. So if they offer their own services, 
they also have to allow competitors that want to offer services over the phone lines. Um, uh, so, okay, so I think I pretty much summarized that. Um, the World Wide Web, invented in 1989. Then the early 90s was when commercial internet um, was launched. So significantly, in terms of regulation, this is what's known as the dial-up error, because this was the way of accessing the internet was through a dial-up service. So you used your, went through your local phone company, you made a local call uh, to a, a local server that could have been owned by AOL or whomever, that then connected you to a computer, which connected you to the internet. So at this time, when people talk about, well, the information service, the dial-up service, was not regulated, that's somewhat true, but not really, because the common carriers that owned the phone line were regulated and have been regulated as common carriers. Um, does that make sense? Okay. So I think that's significant, because if you, for example, were in Vermont and you didn't have a phone line and you didn't want to have a phone line, but you learned about this new dial-up service and you wanted internet, you could call your phone company, it's the same line, the DSL line, and ask them to bring service to your house. And because they're the carrier of last resort, they're regulated as common carriers, they have obligations to bring service to your house, you could technically have them bring you internet service um, in, that, in that manner. So that was then, but then of course this all changes with broadband. Um, when you have the bundling of your, your internet, your broadband, and your phone into one service. And it's all coming over. And they're all separate. So yeah. yeah, yeah. So then you're not reliant on the phone company, or the phone company's regulation doesn't really apply because now you're talking about other other providers, somewhere. whether it's cable or other fiber companies or or the cellular companies now. So, so the dial-up era, the broadband era. Um, then uh, you heard, um, is it Greg? I can't remember his name. Uh, a gentleman who spoke earlier about the, kind of the earliest incarnation of net neutrality was in 2005, the internet policy statement. It was kind of the, one of the initial uh, attempts to uh, clearly specify what practices should or should not happen um, in terms of traffic on the internet. There were four guiding principles in that internet policy statement. Consumers have the right to access and use the lawful content, applications, and devices, that's three, of their choice online and do so in an internet ecosystem defined by competitive markets. Um, so there was still this push towards competition and growing uh, the sector, um, but at the same time trying to ensure that there are some protections of those who use or want to use the the service to, for their own information or to uh, sell uh, products over the internet. Um, as was also mentioned, when the FCC tried to enforce this against Comcast, uh, the courts struck down their authority. They tried to use what's called their ancillary authority because uh, internet access was considered an information service. They didn't, the court said that you don't have enough uh, regulatory authority uh, to make this kind of a requirement on the providers. Um, so that was significant because it started the whole process of, well, what kind of authority does the FCC need to regulate internet traffic? So that's when you had uh, the second attempt by the FCC, which was in 2010, the first open internet order, 
Um, at that time, uh, they didn't, they tried not to rely on their ancillary authority, but there's a specific provision in federal law, section 707, which people argue whether it's a grant of authority or not. Uh, the current FCC absolutely says it's not a grant of regulatory authority. Uh, the courts have disagreed with that. In any event, it wasn't sufficient um, because, and you heard about this earlier, uh, the court said what you're trying to do, FCC, with these net neutrality rules is basically akin to common carriage requirements. And you can't impose common carriage utility style requirements on an information service. By definition, you're, if you're not permitted to do that under the federal law, which is why the first order was predominantly struck down. There were some surviving provisions. And that's why the FCC came back, reclassified broadband as a telecommunications service. Now it could use all of its authority under Title II to the extent it wanted to. It doesn't have to uh, impose all of the requirements, price regulation, whatever, but it could choose. Um, but certainly it gave it much greater teeth. So you can see now where this is going, and that, um, that order was upheld um, by the DC Circuit Court in 2015. Um, there was uh, an appeal to hear the case on banc with the whole panel of um, Circuit Court justices that was denied, and then just recently, um, I believe ATT and others are appealing that decision to the U.S. Supreme Court, and I don't know if they're going to, we don't know if they're going to accept jurisdiction. That's going on now. That original 2015 order is And that pending. 2015 order to claim <coughs> the uh, telecommunication service is what resulted in having the move to the FTC. Here's no, we're not even no, there yet. We're not even there. That's yet. what's yeah. oh, it gets a little bit even more complicated. So okay. that's when they they change they reclassified broadband from an information service to a telecom service, asserted jurisdiction to impose net neutrality provisions, upheld by the court, just recently appealed to the Supreme Court. But in the meantime, change of administration, and then you have uh, Oh, it is on the bottom of this page. The most recent order, the Restoring Internet Freedom Order, adopted this past December, which is now reclassifying broadband as an information service. Okay? So there's still a court case out there to decide whether under, as a telecom service, the original order, but irrespective of that, there's now an effort to repeal that order because it's no longer a telecom service, it's an information service, in which case there's no authority whatsoever for the 2015 order. And, and that order is issued under the new administration? Yeah. 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 So does that make the Supreme Court case moot? Not necessarily, because, uh, and I, I'm guessing the concern is this 2017 order is going to be challenged. Uh, did the FCC have authority to reclassify? You know, there you probably read like I have uh, some of the concerns legally. Uh, was it an arbitrary and capricious decision? Is there a basis in the record for making the reclassification? Who knows? Um, if the court were to strike the 2017 order, we would revert to the 2015. So I'm guessing that. Uh, ATT and others don't want to, uh, they have a, a limited period of time in which to appeal a decision. They can't really wait to see what happens. So, so they, they've appealed it, but they've the, appealed it. the court has not accepted jurisdiction. No, not yet. And mm -hmm. it is possible if the 2000, I mean, I'm not that familiar with uh, the litigation process, but if the 2017 order is litigated as well, mm -hmm. it's conceivable that they could consolidate the two and make a decision. Um, when does the 2017 order theoretically go into effect? Right, so I'm, I'm not certain. There are a couple of um, 
requirements. There's not an effective date in the Act, so technically it's immediate, but there are administrative requirements. It needs to be published in the Federal Register, which it may have been, I'm not sure. It needs to be reviewed by the Office of Budget Management. I'm not sure if I'm getting that right. It's more uh, administrative things that need to happen, and it's not really clear when that's going to happen. Uh, it could happen in a month. It could be several months. It's, those are things that were decided internally. Um, so. so. Go ahead. That 2017 order has been challenged. Right? Are we part of the challenge? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yes. Okay. So the uh, the attorney generals in several states are challenging the order. Um, I don't know if it's actually right for challenge now. I think a petition has been filed, but I'm not sure if it was. They wanted to make sure they got it in on time. Whether it was technically right for for challenge, I I don't know. I'll I'll try to find out more details. But so in that petition, the attorney generals um, are challenging the FCC's. 2017 order primarily under the Administrative Procedures Act um, citing irregularities in process you know that there were um, fraudulent comments posted from people who didn't actually comment when it, when they were going through the notice and comment period um, at one point the system was shut down under a cyber attack and People couldn't access it, but then there's concern about what else happened with the comments. Um, also, under the APA, you can assert an argument that the agency's decision was arbitrary and capricious, not supported by the record, which is what they compiled in that comment process. Um, you know, and this can be argued both ways legally. Uh, but so those are pretty much the grounds. Uh, I believe of the, the AG. Mostly it's procedural, but it also does get to the substance as well to, to some extent. And then in terms of the preemption, uh, I think there, there might be a procedural challenge, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but to the preemption provision as well, procedurally, uh, because that was not in the original notice of proposed rules. So people didn't comment on it, um, and it, there's concern that that's in violation of the federal APA. It was put in at the very end of the process, and that that's insufficient opportunity for people to comment on the preemption issue. So there is a chance that it will be challenged on those grounds. Um, and then, of course, if, if then otherwise, it would be a matter of states uh, enacting legislation that's then challenged and litigated through that avenue. So the this is exciting. <laughs> I do. So I, I, I don't. I won't. We won't. Don't need to go too much into detail, but because we already covered some of this. You know, what's in that, the FCC restoring internet freedom order. Again, they reclassified broadband as an information service. They did preserve the transparency rule to a great extent, which is the disclosure requirement that was in the original 2010 order. Um, like I talked about earlier, that they reaffirm that they have authority to remove any barriers to market entry for providers that want to get into the broadband market. And then uh, they pretty much have said the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, is the new, or is the, uh, the enforcement agency with respect to uh, unfair, anti-competitive, deceptive business practices. So that's, that's where you get into some confusion what Senator Sorokin was raising earlier. So what does that actually mean? And if the FTC, it's now within their jurisdiction, that goes to the heart of kind of the preemption argument because on the one hand, the FCC, the Communications Commission is saying, states, you cannot enact any net neutrality laws 
But if they don't have jurisdiction anymore, is it really, do they have jurisdiction to tell the states they cannot? Clearly, Congress can preempt state laws, but it's not clear at all at the regulatory level whether the FCC or the FTC have the authority to preempt state laws. So, does the 1996 Telecommunications Act say anything about preemption or speak to that issue? It does in different context. Okay. There is, um, there's one, okay, so it says, a, a, in terms of preemption, it says, uh, States are not allowed to um, impose barriers to market entry. So that kind of gets to the FCC can remove barriers. The states are prohibited from uh, imposing conditions that might impede a company's entry into a market. Um, I think that's the big <coughs> one. In other, in other situations, for example, with privacy, when the Communications Commission uh, took over regulation of the internet as a telecom service, there were privacy aspects. It was no longer controlled by the Trade Commission. That's when they did the privacy rules, right? So under those rules, though, they made statements such as, we're not preempting state authority. States can act more protective legislation as long as it's consistent with the federal rules. So I mention that only as an example. For the most part, uh, the preemption is if it's inconsistent with the federal policy. Um, otherwise, states do have some authority in some areas. And there's so much there. It, it covers so many different aspects that um, I'd have to look at each one individually. But those are kind of the, the big issues. So, how are you? What? Where? How do you uh, feel? At your disposal. We've okay. got you and Clay. <laughs> okay. And but if you have to go someplace else right now, it's probably okay. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna, so I'm, I'm gonna come up with this. There isn't that much. I'm gonna, I'll go pretty quickly. Because we're actually, you're hitting on all of the big issues. Yes. And you can see this is a very unsettled area of law, to say the least. Mm -hmm. A lot of All questions. Technology is changing rapidly. Right, and, and at the same time, <laughs> we're deregulating, <laughs> the service is becoming more essential, so do we regulate it or do we just let the market take care of any uh, potential problems? So that's for people um, smarter than I and more invested as stakeholders to debate. Um, so the only other thing, and these were even referenced, so I don't even think we need to go through them in terms of what various state proposals might be, and they're all susceptible to a preemption challenge, more or less, and they're kind of written here, with most susceptible to least susceptible in order. Let me we, ask a question if I yeah, can, and, of and that's just regarding jurisdiction, and the, the whole issue of uh, interstate commerce. Yes. Uh, as to what we could classify as an ISP or a provider that's a Vermont provider. And I saw some of the provisions that you have listed here. And one of the companies that you mentioned, for example, is HughesNet. Now, HughesNet is a satellite provider. My understanding is they don't have anything here in Vermont. They're a national provider. And so my question is, on, on what basis would they be roped into uh, a Vermont law that provides for net neutrality, particularly if the same satellite signal that they're sending is going to people in multiple states, uh, they don't have any jurisdiction here other than to send perhaps a bill to a Vermont consumer, and that Vermont consumer could be in Florida at the time they make the transaction. Yeah, you know, I think this is probably the trickiest jurisdictional issue, uh, uh, not just with satellite, but with broadband mm -hmm. in general. Yeah. And I think uh, if the state did have regulatory authority, it would be because they are providing service to a Vermonter. Mm -hmm. Lots of businesses don't, are not located in Vermont, but they sell their services in the stream of commerce that end up in Vermont. Mm -hmm. And the Vermont uh, legislature says we require our products to meet these standards. And sometimes they have to comply. Even if the product is not made here, it's not manufactured, grown, but it's in the stream of commerce, it ends up in Vermont. If they want to ship. You know, the issue is, you know, is it shipped here, so, which you can, with a physical product, 
is perhaps relatively easy to define, yeah. but with a product that's a virtual product uh, that you don't really know whether it's been delivered in Vermont or not. Well, they're sending you a bill. Mm -hmm. But you still may, you, for example, the Vermonter who, who spends his or her winter in Florida right. is getting the product yeah. in Florida. All they're getting in Vermont is a bill. True, but they wouldn't be using the Vermont service anymore. They'd be using a different service in Florida. Well, if it was with HughesNet, they'd be using the same service, wouldn't they? That's That's a, they, they advertise yeah. themselves as a as a as national, national single yeah. point of yeah. service. Yeah. And, no, and I just mentioned yes. that no, now. You're absolutely right you know, to raise the question. Although there's one of those now, the future of, of, of broadband is probably through wireless providers yeah. that are not geographically fixed. But they can still throttle it, have fast lanes, slow lanes. They can do all those things yeah. that interfere with access. Yeah, I'm not saying whether that's yeah, no, good or bad. I'm just saying that you well, know, do we have a jurisdictional problem <laughs> in terms of the kind of laws that we're try that we're talking about okay. imposing here? Uh, that's question one, and, and the other question that I have, I know in the limited amount of time, is uh, you, you, you suggested in your presentation thus far that there is a significant potential for litigation, regardless of what we do, or at least if we, in, in effect, did something in terms of enacting a state law, and uh, I, I would like to explore just a little bit as to what our exposure is and you know, how much that's going to cost us potentially. Yeah, I wouldn't be able to answer that. That's the Attorney General's office okay. could speak more to that issue. I will just say one thing on your point because I, the jurisdictional issue, you're right, it is huge. Um, what gives me a little bit of pause to say, well, wait, there might actually be more of a hook. There was a case that had to do with a voice over internet, voice service, right? Um, and uh, for the reasons you just said, uh, I think this was in Minnesota, um, the court held that the Public Utility Commission in Minnesota did not have jurisdiction over the voice service because you couldn't know where the call, call was beginning, where it was ending, this was all done over broadband. <coughs> so in one sense, that could be the end of the conversation and maybe close the issue. However, in the opinion, the court said, we recognize that our decision is temporal in nature because companies, all companies, are developing the capacity for geolocation and for phone services, whether it's VoIP <coughs> or the internet or any other service. Um, in fact, to a degree which I'm not totally up to speed on, is required to be able to have some location accuracy for 911 purposes. So I'm not an engineer. I have no idea how complicated it is. But presumably, to some extent, maybe not enough for jurisdiction, there's some capacity to know where calls are actually coming from at all times. At the same time, there's also a movement to give consumers the power to limit what ISPs and others can know about them and their activities in order to protect their privacy. Yep. Yep. Okay. It's, and it's very I'm trying to figure. I know we asked you to draft a bill or a statement that would do probably the least, nothing like the House. There's been a couple of gubernatorial actions just yep. to put us on. And I didn't know if we wanted to do that. Or Clay, do you have anything to add to the discussion at this point? Anything we're not hearing, we should hear. Or anything I've incorrectly stated. Uh, no, I think Maureen did a very good job um, <coughs> succinctly stating the law. Um, I, I think from our position, you know, we're very much in favor of net neutrality. Um, as principals, we would um, uh, encourage you to exercise caution and take time to um, think about these issues. Uh, you know, the law is, as Maria pointed out, very unsettled at this point. There are challenges to the uh, restoring internet freedom order. Um, there, um, Congress may act. Congress really should act. Um, you just said the word Congress and act in the yeah. same sentence. <laughs> it is. It's kind of paradoxical. Um, <laughs> We have, 
we have state laws coming out, or uh, bills in uh, state houses all across the country, and there is this open issue of uh, preemption and to what extent, um, depending on what actions the uh, or what direction the uh, uh, this body chooses to go in, whether that's preempted and um, how that will play out. So. Um, but that's more or less what I was going to speak to. Um, I'd love to come back and um, talk more with you about um, uh, this issue. But um, <clears throat> those are our, our general thoughts at this okay. time. And I think there's, I know some people that are very interested in making a statement or maybe the most <clears throat> conservative statement we can we can about what Vermont will do, and I, I think that's what you drafted. Yep, so I left it over there, but so I drafted something, uh, sort of modeled out for what Montana and New York have done so far, which is basically making that neutrality compliance a condition of obtaining any state contracts for internet service, so government contracts. I think it is within our jurisdiction to say what we, what we will, who we will run that contract with. Uh, pretty much. I think that there is um, kind of a long-standing tradition that when the state is acting like a consumer, just like other consumers in the market, uh, it can make similar choices and decide what kind of service and from whom. And so that's uh, what this proposal attempts to do in law. Um, just briefly, I can tell you it allows or asks the Secretary of Administration to develop a process where internet providers can certify that they're in compliance with net neutrality standards. That's subsection A, subsection B are the the actual standards that need to be met, and they reflect all the um, kind of principles and standards we talked earlier, no blocking, no throttling, no paid prioritization, no, uh, no interfering unreasonably, and uh, disclosure requirements. And that pretty much takes us all the way to page Three, subsection C, the secretary can waive the prohibition on paid prioritization. Um, I can't come up with examples, but uh, there's been some talk that there may be legitimate reasons for allowing paid prioritization, and if it's in the public interest, the secretary could waive that requirement. And then the last would, section. Would, would first responders be an example? Uh, that's paid. I don't know if it's paid either. Okay. Yeah, I think that they don't need to pay for that service. And then D is just the definitions. They're all similar to ones that we discussed. And so that, that sets out the process and the standards. Section 2 on page 4 um, is basically a requirement that that condition of com the complying with net neutrality is part of the what's bulletin 3.5 is their procurement contract. Um, section 3 pertains to the agency of digital services in the executive branch with any of their contracts. Section 4, uh, any contracts for the legislative branch. Uh, same requirement. And then finally, page 6, section 5, uh, these would be for any internet contracts within, within the judicial branch. And I will say that there's the judicial branch doesn't always like being told what to do, and they have a legitimate uh, point you know, in terms of separation of powers. Right. But sometimes it's an issue, sometimes it's not an issue. It depends what the. Okay. But I just wanted to flag that. So that that's true. Yeah. All right. Committee, that's. It.